Our next speaker, Brother Lavelle Henry, received a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Sam Houston State University in 1984. He is currently employed with Beaumont Independent School District as a supervisor of operations. He's been married to Dorothy for 35 years, and they have two children, Tremaine, 36, and Patera, 33. Lavelle has preached for the Riverside Church of Christ, Smith Grove Church of Christ, Northside Church of Christ, and Walker County Church of Christ. He now serves and has been for some time as one of the elders for the faithful Fitch Hatchery Road congregation in Huntsville, Texas. We count him as a dear friend, a faithful elder and gospel preacher, and we're thankful that we have such men as Lavelle proclaim the truth. Brother Lavelle is going to speak to us on one God and one Bible as that fits into the unity that is demanded by Christ. Brother Lavelle, come preach to us. Remember what I said, are you going to rare or are you going to rare to go? <laughs> Maybe some of both. <laughs> It's certainly good to be here this morning. Uh, we're always thankful for each opportunity that we have when we can speak to you from the Word of God. I'm thankful to this congregation and to the elders of this congregation for this opportunity of being able to speak on this topic of one God, one Bible. As I begin all of my lessons, I want you to think with me this morning. The Bible says there in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through verse number 6, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It says, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. It says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And the seventh of these great unities is God himself. Now I want you to think with me. The Bible says there in the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17. It says, and whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whatever we do, as we go about preaching the gospel, or whether in worship or wherever it is, we've got to have Bible authority. And Bible authority is the only way we're going to have for knowing what we can and cannot do. Now, I want you to think with me now. It says there in Colossians chapter 1 and the verses number 10, Paul speaking to the, the church at Corinth. He said, now I beseech you, brethren. He said, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no division among you, but you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, seeing how there is but one Bible, we should all walk by the same rule. Seeing how it's one Bible, we should all speak the same thing. Therefore, there should be no division among us. And since there should be no division among us, we should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If not, something must be wrong today. Now I want you to think with me now, seeing how we have one Bible. How do I go about determining then what's right and what's wrong? I go to the rule book, which is the Word of God. Seeing how the Word of God is the rule book, and how we find our authority from that rule book according to Colossians 3.17. We cannot find authority from other search books, such as the Methodist Discipline, which contains the doctrine and the laws of the United Methodist Church, originally published in 1784 by a man named John Wesley. Nor can we find authority in books such as the Book of Mormons, whose office Joseph Smith, Jr., who founded the Mormon Church, and the Latter-day Saints movement, 
Now, I want you to think with me. When he was 24 years old, he published this thing called the Book of Mormons. But we can't find Bible authority there in the Book of Mormons. Nor can we find Bible authority in the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, nor Catechism of the Catholic Church. Bible authority can be only found in his word, which is the Bible. So, seeing how we only have one rule book, which is the Bible, then we should all speak the same thing. Now, how do we determine all of this, Lavelle, and what do we do to make sure that we understand what God would have for us to do? You know, when I look around today and on every corner, I see a different religious denomination. And all of these religious denominations on every corner. Now, first of all, let me go back and let, let me slow it out a little bit. According to Webster now, it said now a denomination is a recognized autonomous branch of the Christian church. It said a Christian denomination is a distinct religious body within Christianity. It says that it's identified by traits such as name, organization, doctrine, individual bodies. It's also identified itself many as churches, as conventions of assembly, of houses, of unions, and of fellowship. Now, I want you to realize what I just said. Now, we got all these different things identified in all kind of different ways. And everybody say, well, that's fine. But my topic now, remember what it was, one God, one Bible. I want you to think with me now. Let's talk about something we all understand. You know, when I look around within the sports world today, you know, if I look at high school sports, when I go to studying about high school sports, when we come to what rules they're going to follow in any athletic event, they're going to follow the book called UIL Rules. You know, when I look a little further and I study collegiate, Sports. They're going to follow those written by the NCAA, those rule book. When I look around at all the professional sports, they all have their own rule books. They all have pertaining to those things of whatever sport they're playing. Now, we understand that if I'm going to play professional football, I can't follow a rule book that's designed by the UIL. I understand that if I'm playing professional football, I can't follow the NCAA rule book. And you know, we understand these things here just fine, but when it comes to Bible, when it comes to what we do as Christians, we seem not to understand these things. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning, seeing how it's only one rule book. And that rule book is where we get our authority. Now I want you to follow me now. The Bible says now, there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, now all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It says, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. Follow me now. It says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So you know what? Seeing how I don't have but one rule book, and that's the Bible. When I want my doctrine, I better make sure that I go to the Bible. When I want to correct something, I better make sure I do it from the Bible. When I want to go along and know what righteousness is, I need to make sure that I find my thought from the Word of God. Not from all of those others that I mentioned, not from everything else that these denominations will have us to believe, not from man, but from the Word of God. See, because the will of God can only be found in his word. What do you mean, Lavelle, the will of God can only be found in his word? Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So if I want to go to heaven, I've got to do the will of God. The only place that I can find the will of God is in his word. So if I don't study his word, and I study something written by man, then I'm not going to make it to heaven, and I'm not going to do the will of God. Because the will of God can only be found in his word. And that's who's going to make it to heaven. Psalms 119, verse number 105 makes it plain. He say, thy word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Only way is to follow the word of God. And that word of God is going to direct us in how we should go. You know, and 
Many don't understand this because they go to thinking, well, you know, God speaks to me and God told me this. You know, but I, I want to tell those, God only speaks to us one way nowadays. Let's do his word. Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, God who at summary times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. He say, having these latter days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has a permanent heir of all things and by whom he has made all things. God's going to speak to us through his word. And his word is the Bible. And we only have one Bible. So how can we have all these other different things? So how can we have all these different understandings? Something's wrong somewhere. Follow me now. Now, my topic is not only one Bible, but one God. See, now, when we have one God, and that one God's word is in that one Bible that we have. Bible says that in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26, it said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and over the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over the creeping things that creep on the earth. God here speaking now, we don't have but one God. God said, though, let us make man in our image. Well, many would question today, what was God talking about? Well, God was talking about someone else because there must have been others there because he said, let us. When he said us, I believe he was directly talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Well, why do you say that, Lavelle? I say it because when we look at it and we really study this, the Bible says in John chapter 5 and verse number 7, it said there are three that bear record in heaven. It said the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So three that bear record in heaven. And these three are one. Now we're going to talk about why these three are one and what's the importance of these three. But now I want you to watch now because God said let us. Well, who is he talking about? Those that bear record in heaven. Now go a little further. The Bible says there in John, Chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Think with me now. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So, in the beginning now, was the Word, and the Word was with God. So, we're answering some of this question when he said, let us make man. Because the Word was there with him when? In the beginning. And it says, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So the us is coming together. Of God saying, let us make man in our own image. Now I want you to think with me now. Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through about verse number 18. He said, now, who is the image of the invisible God? He said, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is head of the body of the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things he might have the preeminence. Now who was that talking about? Once again, talking about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All things by him, for him, made by him. So there in the beginning, he was there with God. All things made by him. Now. That us has come together, and we're understanding what that us means. Now, all of these being the same, what do you mean, Lavelle, all of them being the same? Bible says in John chapter 14, I want you to think on this verse. Now, Philip said unto him, he said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, show us the Father. Now, you imagine, now he asked in Jesus, show us the Father. And it suffices us. 
Jesus said unto him, he said, have I so long time been with you that you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen the Father, how saith thou, show us the Father? Now watch what he just said. He said, now, how, Philip, are you saying, show us the Father? He said, as long as you've been with me, and you say, show us the Father. He's teaching Philip a lesson. What lesson is he teaching Philip? He says, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? And the word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, and he does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very word's sake. These three here all speaking the same thing. All combined for the same purpose. Let us make man in our own image. Well, why do you say, Lavelle, they, they all speaking the same thing? Because when you go and you look at John 16 and verse 13 through verse number 15, here Jesus speaks and watch what he says. He says, however, when he, the spirit has come. See, he, he had promised that he was going to send the comfort back to guide them in a way of righteousness. He said, now he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatsoever he hears, he'll speak. The Holy Spirit now is going to speak what he heard. So he's going to speak the same thing that God the Father has said, the same thing that God the Son has said. What do you mean, LaVell? Watch now. He's going to speak what he hears, and he will tell you things to come. He said, now, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it unto you. Jesus said, now, the Holy Spirit's going to take what's mine, and he's going to declare that unto you. But here's the thing. Jesus said, what is mine, he got from the Father. So what is the Father was Jesus, and what is Jesus belong to the Holy Spirit. So we talking about one. Follow me now. But then he said, therefore I say, he will take a man and declare that to you. And then if you look at Corinthians chapter 8, it kind of brings all this together. How does it bring it together? It says, as concerning therefore the eating of things that are offered and sacrificed to idols. We know that our idol is nothing in the world. And that there is none other God but one. None other God but one. Now, none other but one. It says, for though there be called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, and there be called gods many and lost many. He said, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom in all things, and he will, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by him. Men in the day don't understand what I'm talking about here when I say that there is one God. You know, I look around the day and I can remember clearly I was studying with someone that was a United Pentecostal. And I remember the doctrine that these United Pentecostals teach on this one God. They tried to tell me now, one God, they said that God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all the same person. They said now these were just titles assigned to one individual. And that's how they explain this one God situation. But you know what? They need to study. Need to wake up and understand what's taking place. See, if this was true, we're going to have issues. But you know, it's, that doctrine is prevalent. You know, when you look around and you start really thinking about it. So many would, would believe that this is all the same. But you know, I, I went and I, I asked him, well, man, can you do me a favor? Can you open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 3? And when you open it up to Matthew chapter 3, can you put your finger on verse 16? And let's read verse 16 and 17. It's saying, when Jesus was baptized, went up straight way out of the water, 
And lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he said, and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighted upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right here in this passage of scripture, you have Jesus, a poet, being baptized. You have the Holy Spirit in that same place, descending like a glove. And you also have God the Father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Three distinctions, three separate, but all in the same place, unified, all being one, standing for the same thing, speaking the same thing, and having the same understanding. But they want to tell me that these were just titles assigned to them. All the same person. See, we got to study the word of God. You know what? We can't go around and just let folks teach us anything and tell us anything. We've got to study so that we can have an understanding of what we should do. Why? Because if we only have, like I say, that one rule book and one God, one God now, so one God is going to give his one rule. And if we don't follow that one rule, we're not going to be able to make it to heaven. I want you to continue to think with me. We read in the beginning, but I want to read again verse 4 through 6. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are calling, one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, this one God right here, when you look up that word God, theos in the Greek. This indicates God the Father. It also indicates God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Three of those. But standing unified with the same understanding, with the same belief, and the same teaching. That's the same way that we, being many, are one in the body. One, because we have the same understanding. And there shouldn't be any division among us. You know, I believe that's why Malachi said, have we not all one father, have not one God created us? Study the word of God. One God created us. You know, Paul told the Galatians, he said, for ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, when you study 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should all be called the children of God, and such are we. This one God is the Christian's Father. This one God who gave us his rule book, that one Bible, that we should live our lives by and follow and do what he would have for us to do. Now, we can be recognized as a son of God through obedience to his gospel. You know, whether somebody say Jews or whether somebody say Gentiles or what somebody ever want to call it, but since there is only one God, there can only be one gospel. And seeing how there's only one gospel message, we all must be of the same mind. Otherwise, I believe somebody's wrong somewhere. Therefore, I want you to think with me now. See, if there were many gods, we would have many gospels. And if we had many gods and we had many gospels, then somewhere along the line, you would have to be true to one and neglect the other. Then we got mass confusion, and that's what denominationism presents. Mass confusion. Because they want to have many gospels. They want to have many rule books. So therefore, you got divisions and you got loyalty to one rule book and loyalty to another rule book. So therefore, they have no unity. But now, that's not what Paul was teaching. That's not what the word of God was pushing. He was teaching that these ones, this one God and one Lord and all of these ones here, this was not something fragile that, you know, that we could just go and say, I, I've got to find a way to agree on this. What he was teaching that these are fixed realities that we all must believe and obey. 
one God, the same God, therefore there must be unity. What do you mean? There See, if there were many gods to be worshipped, there could be no hope of unity, and there could be no hope of unity among the many believers throughout the world. You know, because if I set up many gods or many idols, how can we have unity? Because I'm going to be law to one, you'll be law to another one, so where is the unity? May have union in one form or fashion, but it's not unity. And union can be very chaotic. People who have different pursuits, different objectives, and different loves can expect to have no unity. That's why we have to have one God and one rule book, which is the Bible. People who worship many gods can have no hope of unity. Their actions are dedicated to feelings and love towards that one that they direct their attentions to. And that's the only thing that's going to happen there. But see, where there is a supreme love, where there is supreme honor, and where all of these things are attached to that one God, we can have nothing but unity. Because, as I said before, he's the Christian's father. You know, I, I look at the family situation, and when I look at a family, you see so much dedication many times because they'll look at the dedication of what the father stands for, what the mother stands for, and they all come together, and you've got that strong bond, the oneness there. And that's what happens within the body of Christ. You know, I, I like making analogies, so I, I want you to think with me. You know, have you ever remember back when you was a child and maybe you was going to play baseball? And you didn't have everything you needed. So probably didn't even have enough players. May not have even had the bases or whatever you needed. And, and you just get out there. And the first thing you do, you come together and you, you make up some rules. And when you make up these rules, you say, well, here's what we're going to do. That tree right over there, that's first base. This tree over here is second base. This stick right over there is third base. And right here is home. And you get in the middle of the game and you go to trying to make it work and somebody gets mad and then you arguing and fussing over these so-called rules and everybody ends up walking off. That's the chaoticness you get when you try to say that there are many gods, when you try to say that there are many rule books, when you try to say that all these things are not together, you're not going to have any unity. It's just as chaotic as that little game that we played as children when we try to have unity, but when we go to changing rules, well, now that tree right there is not first. This one over here is. But that's what you see in what these denomination worlds. They argue and fuss. And why? Because they've changed the rules. They want to go use another rule book other than the one that God gave us. See, the unity that we share is based upon our unity with God and the unity that's shared between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The oneness there. And the oneness all speaking the same thing, all having the same understanding. And that's what was spoken in the scripture when they say we should all be of the same mind and same understanding and no divisions be among us. We're not arguing over what's first and what's second. We're not arguing over what we do in worship or what we can't do in worship. We are united because we all have the same rule book and the same understanding. And we all rest upon that oneness of God, that oneness of faith, that oneness of baptism, that oneness of hope, that oneness of spirit. These ones is what matter to us. And you may say, LaVelle, well, what's the importance of these ones? What's the importance of the one God? What's the importance of the one Bible? I want you to think with me as I try to show us the importance of it. You know what? Seeing how it's one and only one, then everybody in the world needs to know about it. 
Everybody in the world needs to be taught that there is one God. Everybody in the world needs to be taught from that one Bible. So why? Because there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, who died for everyone. And we need to teach those that. The one spirit, we need to teach them who came and taught us about the truths about salvation. That one faith, that single faith that everybody can stand up on. Then one baptism, that's the means of getting into Christ. That one hope that awaits every Christian. That one and only body, that's the body of Christ, the church, that we need to teach others about. That oneness, all united with the one God. And only one God. If it's not that way, there's a problem. And you know what? Since there's only one, we need to rally as Christians around that oneness. And as we rally around that oneness, we got to go out and preach to the world. And we got to tell them that it's only one. And as we tell them that it's only one, we need to tell them, as it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12, it says, there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby which we must be saved. No other name. One. You're not going to find salvation over here. You're not going to find salvation over there. You're not going to find salvation in another God. As we mentioned, you're not going to find it in all those other books that we mentioned. And I only mentioned a few, but it's I don't know how many of them when you go to study it. And you go to listen what all these folks would have you to believe. And what they would tell you about all these ones that we're speaking about. You know what? Our oneness rests on the true factor of us believing that there is one God and what we must do. Now, think with me as we try to bring this to a close. This oneness now was played a vital role, you know, when, in the beginning, when the church was being was started. Because they were all of the same mind and all of the same understanding, and that they, they preached that it was one God. And that was, I believe, why the gospel was so effective. They were united in the things that they did. And they understood that the only way that this was going to work is that they were one like God was, like Jesus, and like the Son. They understood these ones. They understood what they had to do. You know, sometimes you ought to just think about some of the stuff that happened. You know, think about how the Jews and the Gentiles came together. How could they be fellow heirs? Because they were one, a little one God. And united is one. Because they had that access through the one spirit of what he taught them. That, that one rule book. The Holy Spirit came and directed them in the ways of righteousness. That ways of righteousness was written in that one rule book, that one Bible. That one Bible tells us what we can and what we cannot do. In other words, this uniqueness now, all is based upon that there is one. There can be no misunderstandings. There can be no different interpretations. Because everybody would, would, would want to say, well, that's your belief or that's your understanding. Well, yes, that's my belief and my understanding. But my belief and my understanding comes from the one God who is the author of that one rule book. I know he's the author because it said that he basically had the word. Jesus came and bought the word. And then when he went back, he sent the Holy Spirit back to give that word. Who didn't speak of himself, but spoke of what Jesus said. And Jesus spoke of what the Father, because he said what was the Father was his. So we got one God, the author of that one rule book, which is the Bible. So where everything else comes in, I'm not sure. But I know it can't be the truth. As I close, think with me in this statement. If there were many true gods, then there would have to be many saviors. And if there were many true gods and many saviors, there would have to be many valid faiths. And if there were many true gods and many saviors and many valid faiths, then there would have to be many different baptisms that would lead us unto salvation. Then there would be little need for preaching of the gospel because everybody believed different, everybody got different understandings. 
So we could throw this Bible away if that were true. Seeing how we know that can't be true, we have to believe that there is one God, that there is one Bible, and we have to follow these unities. Thank you. Well, a hearty amen to that. We have had some excellent lessons, and that one just topped it off as far as I'm concerned. We appreciate Brother Lavelle and his love for the truth, his good wife. Appreciate all of these who have done such a fine job. We're going to be uh, dismissed here in a 